by divine timing. And I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for it in Jesus' name. Uh, how many were here last week when Kim talked talk on getting out of the boat? Hey, you know, we're in a lot of this nation, the whole world, the waters, very stormy. There are principalities, demonic forces that are moving in, in the Middle East, uh, over America, nations. They are all bringing things to pass which are prophetically happening. The world is about to go through some difficult times. The church is going to go through some challenging times. But we as believers have to know what Jesus said. He said, when you see tribulation happening, he said, don't fear. Don't let anything move you by fear, but let's lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh. And he also, I mean, the scripture said in it, Paul said, in everything, always, that we triumph in Christ. So, Philip and I were talking about this just, you know, a little while ago. And, of course, we're in ministry, been in for years, and we know it. You know, sometimes things are, are a little rocky, but, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to kick it that direction, you know. You, you just got to keep moving because you're not, you're not shaken, what a beautiful song, I will not be shaken, not shaken by the things that are happening. Ministries who we've acknowledged, respected, very hurtful in ways, but this has happened before. I've seen three ministries in the last two months fall. And these men have worldwide ministries. And I want to say this to everybody. The people that operate behind this pulpit, they carry an anointing, they carry an office, they carry an authority, but they, ha they do also stand before Jesus. Now, they're human but we love and we respect and we honor the office, but I want you to hear me. Sin, no matter who it is, it's going to cost you. And honestly, it costs more when you're behind him because of who you represent. But because of that, guys, can I tell you, I went through Gene Swagger, the Bakers, Bob Tilton, all of them. I went through all that years ago. Just bam, bam, bam. And they're gone. They did not judge their house. God gave them opportunity. I know, I know behind stories and stuff, but they were given prophetic words and they would not judge the sin in their life. Now the Lord honors that. People might say, how can God honor that? Well, the gifts and the callings of God are without reproach. He's going to honor the gift. But eventually, what sticks is your character. You may not be the best preacher in the world, but I'd rather have someone who have integrity and is honest and lived it. And, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm human like anybody else, but we follow people. I'm not making excuses for sin, but there is a humanity. And I, you guys have heard me teach this. There's a, there's a human part of all of us, and sometimes we miss it. When you're up behind the pulpit and the anointing of God's flowing, sometimes people look and go, oh, my gosh, what would it be like if they were in me? You would be shocked. You know, because we're who we are. I like things done the way I like it. And, and, you know, I always say, bless God, I'm the head of my family. Well, my wife's the neck, you know. But 
I'm saying all this to say this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one who's worthy. And let's not judge because we're all guilty of things. We, we, we live in a broken society. Gosh, there's so much damage in people's lives. God still anoints and uses people in ways with all their flaws and their, their stuff. It's amazing what God does. But he brings us into perfection, into him, as long as we're willing to submit to the correction. Listen, guys, the word of God is not here just to motivate you. The word of God is not here just to affirm you. And our generation, and you have to give me 30 affirmations before you can tell me what I'm doing is wrong. I just go, y'all got to be kidding me. You know, that's ridiculous. God won't do that. He affirms us, but man, the word of God is here to transform us into his image. And the more I submit to him, I worship and understand, I realize that he is everything. He is my glory. He is my my, my king, I am responsible to him. I love him. I have accountability from our board and our elders to help me and all of us to stay as pure as we can and do this as right as we can. We do. And this is not a perfect church, but thanks to, I'll tell you what, this is a sweet church. And we're here and we love people and we help people. What's happening is the world, things are shaking. That's very scriptural, the things that's happening. I was praying this week, I was thinking about the services, and I just heard this in my heart. I preached on this years ago, but just heard this, Carrie, just draw near to me. Just draw near. Three times in the New Testament, he uses that word. Twice in Hebrews and once in, um, in James. So I'm going to take this, and let me share this next 20 minutes, but I want you, for this week, I want you to draw near to God. I want you to draw near. Pastor Terry, how do you draw near? Give him some extra time. That's the one thing you can never go back and kill. Take time. If there are things that are challenging you, give it to the Lord. Take time to spend time. Pray for these meetings. Encourage people to come. Draw near to God. I want you to look at this. And it's all found in James chapter 4. I'm going to walk through over the next few weeks. I'll walk through James chapter 4. I have gone through James chapter 5, which is one of the most prophetic chapters in the New Testament about the end time, about the latter rain. But it's so interesting when you go back and see James, what he's writing. Man, I'm telling you, he really is about getting the junk out of your life. Before you're going to have a latter rain, you better make sure your character and your heart is right with people. And especially as a church that we're working together in unity. So now listen to this. He says, and in, in this is our theme verse, James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Well, Pastor Terry, he's, he's talking to the lost. No, he's not. He's talking to the church who had given themselves over to the flesh and they were committing sin. Now, they, they're not lost people who are strictly a sinner, but what they were doing, they were Christian people who were continuing to sin. So James is dealing with these people, and he said, purify your heart. Notice he didn't say, go clean yourself up. What did he say? Purify your heart. Get your, you double-minded. So he's telling you, Draw near to God. So we're going to take these scriptures, but I want you to look. Here is number one in drawing near to God. If we're going to prepare ourselves for what God wants to do in our life. Number one, forgive. 
and avoid any strife, chaos, or conflicts. Everybody say amen to that. There is plenty around to go. And I want you to listen to what he says, verse number one. What is the cause of your conflict, your strife and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? You je your jealousy, you want what others have so that you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme, you envy, and you harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and you fight. And all the time, you don't obtain what you want because you don't ask God for it. That happens in a church world when the church all gets together. I mean, oh, you have got all kinds of people at all stages of life. You can have some 40-year-old toddlers in your church. You can. Now, I won't go any further. But to define what James is saying is well, you got to get the strife out. You cannot have unity when you are fighting over things that really don't matter. And, you know, you know the saying, you need to pick your own battles? Absolutely. Most of the time, you just need to stay out of it. I used to have to help my daughter, McKenna, bless her heart. She couldn't get any of her homework done because her, uh, the Facebook, all the, I, I picked her Facebook, I said, now listen to this, and went through it. And she had about 20 people all giving their viewpoints over something that happened in school. And I just looked at her. I said, and you want to know why you can't get your homework done? I said, McKenna, give me your phone. Oh, oh, my God. I mean, oh, my Lord. I mean, I've corrected her before, but I never had anything make such an impact. She had to, no, 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 no. I said, they don't need to know your opinion. I said, all it does is create 10 more opinions. And y'all are just a big gossip pool. But dad, you don't understand. Honey, I'm a lot older than you. I fully understand. I said, your phone goes to me. And then you're going to bring your homework down. And you're going to show me that it's done. Then I'll give you your phone. I've never seen homework done so fast in all my life but we get addicted to chaos and I'm going to tell you there are people just as guilty as everybody else I mean if, if I were to say everybody the usher is going to take up your phones <laughs> I'd have people falling out in the floor <laughs> people would think the revival hit you know but it's because my world, and I have to admit, my whole world's on that phone. Everything, all my sermons, everything, and I have to keep everything honest on the phone because Kim's always going through my stuff. She likes my stuff better than hers. I go, where's my phone? I go, honey, you ain't getting nothing because I'm I lead a very boring life. Just too funny. All right. Strife is defined as bickering, discord, antagonism, and quarreling. That's what strife is. Now, when James wrote this, number one, this is James the less. He was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. This is not the apostle James. James the less was the pastor of the first church of Jerusalem. So as he's writing this, believe me, he knows what conflict is. Because he, did you know that the Gentile church did not come into the kingdom for 10 years after Pentecost? So for 10 years, you're pastoring a group of Jewish people 
who have come out of 613 laws. Welcome to Impact Church. Now here's 613 things you guys have to do. You'd be going, is there another church around here? It couldn't be accomplished. So, now I want you to see everything's going well with the church. Man, I mean, adding to the church daily. I mean, people all wrapped around. They're very carefully leading the Jewish people. They're still keeping the feast. They're still doing certain things. They had cut certain things out. But lo and behold, God decides just to shake the whole mess up. And there's a Gentile by the name of Cornelius who had been praying. And an angel appeared and says, Cornelius, the Lord just loves you and you've won favor. And Peter's over there on the, on the housetop. And God starts setting down, instead of all the kosher food, all of a sudden he's seeing barbecued pork and he, he has seen uh, lobster tails, crawfish, oysters, and, God, and shrimp. And God says, rise up and eat. And he goes, no way. I mean, I, I can't eat that. And you know better than that because you're the one who told us we can't eat that. And then God says, Peter, if you ever call unclean, He's like shaking his head. He's like, my goodness. And then all of a sudden, God puts another spread in front of him. And he's looking at all this food, and, he, and, and God says, rise up and eat. And he goes, we can't do that. And he said, don't you ever call unclean what I call clean. Little did Peter understand what was happening. The angel tells Cornelius, go get Peter. Now, God is about to do something to bring salvation to the world. And it will not happen without a mess being made because we're all human. Now, when God starts shaking this last day world, I'm going to flat tell you it is going to be different than what we ever expected. My only prayer is that all of us can be sane enough to look what is God and what's not. And be a part of it because I was a part of the Jesus movement back in 1973 and 4. And when we went to the church, I mean, the Jesus movement, oh my gosh, the hair went out. My hair was way down here. Uh, we weren't singing the hymnals. The generation behind us, or way ahead of us, my mom and dad, and thank God that my mother was smart enough. But that group of people, they were upset. That pastor sang a song without a hymnal, and the words went up on the wall. And there were people back there like this. God ordained a hymnal. And it's fact. And when I went to my first church meeting as a senior, you know what they fought over? Are we going to? upgrade the Hammond organ because you cannot have a service without a Hammond you can't and everybody was fighting over an organ and I was smart enough I, I mean I just got gloriously changed and I, I didn't say one word to my parents but I looked at that and it got checked in my mind and I said isn't it amazing that there are so many people being touched by the glory of God, and we're all bent out of shape over an organ. That is religion. That's not Jesus. You love and you respect. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I know we all come from different backgrounds, but James, what he had to deal with was... The next thing you know, Peter goes over there. The, they meet, and he goes over to Cornelius, and he's looking around. you got all these Gentiles. Cornelius was in the military. He was a Roman citizen. 
and he's got all these Gentiles, and he's thinking about this vision, and they said, would you please preach to us? And Peter's going, what is about to happen? So he preaches. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They get baptized in the Holy Ghost. The whole household is shaken, and, and then they're going, can we be baptized? And Peter's going, yeah, I, I guess. And they baptized them. It kicks off. And now here comes James. Bless his heart. He's got a church full of Jewish people. And now these Gentiles are coming in. Oh, my gosh. And when they leave, they're eating barbecue. They're... they're <laughs> They're doing stuff. They're, they're not doing all the stuff that normally has to be done to come into the temple. These guys just think they can pray anytime. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And so James is caught up in the middle of this. He has the wisdom of God to know because they have a huge convention. They bring everybody together in Acts chapter, I think it's 17, 16 or 17, and it's called, it's, it is, it's the, the Council of Jerusalem. And at the time, here comes Paul, Barnabas, all these guys that are out ministering to the Gentiles, and all the apostles get there, and they have a huge meeting. And it's like, what are we going to put on the Gentiles? Paul stands up. He says, let me tell you what you put on them. Zero. They're born again in the Spirit. They're part of the family. They don't have to do 16 and 613 laws. Those days are gone. We are under grace. Whew. Hallelujah. Way to go, Paul. Barnabas stood up. Now, there was some, there was some head knocking over this. No, 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 no. You, these people can't. They, they have to look like us. They got to do this. They got to be in the temple. They have to, oh my gosh, they're not keeping the feast days. <laughs> now, you know what I find amazing? The Holy Spirit did not intervene. It's just amazing to me. He was involved, but he let them figure it out. He didn't have an angel come up and go, okay, I'm going to settle this whole deal. No. He let them settle it by the Holy Spirit. And then James takes everybody and he says, when he finishes, he said, it is good for what has happened. Because we all, and here is the consensus. He was the one who held the gavel. Now, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, it wasn't a theocracy. No, he had all the apostles. They were all there. And they came to the conclusion by the Holy Spirit. He said, it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit that the Gentiles who come into the kingdom, we're only going to put three things on them. Number one, don't drink blood. That is really easy. <laughs> that is, I am so glad he said that. Hallelujah. I've been in some countries and they want me to drink blood. No, no, no. I have a scripture. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not drinking blood. Number two, number two is don't eat food that's been offered to idols. Y'all have never, many of you never seen this, but I've been in the temple in Sri Lanka, the Buddhist, Buddha, with the tooth of Buddha's in there, is what they say. And all the food that's offered to the idols. That's the way it was back in his days. The Romans did all that. So they said, don't eat food that you know is offered to an idol. Third thing, and here it is. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Don't you know, and do you know what happened? They wrote that letter. Paul takes those letters, starts sending out all to the church, Gentile churches. Guess what the Gentiles did? That is a fact. I mean, they're ready, they're ready like, man, am I going to have to give up my barbecue? Am I, am I, have to, I can't eat oysters anymore. I know they were all fair. They get up, three things, don't drink blood, 
We can do that. Don't eat food that's offered to an idol. That's an easy one. And number three, keep yourself unspotted in the world. And the Bible says the church is celebrated because of the liberty. And God's up there just laughing. He is. And he's going, welcome to change. I am so glad we live under grace. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, James. James put up with it. He had to deal with it. Churches have to deal with it. Now, I'm going to show you something real quick, and I'll bring this down. But I'm going to flip over to James chapter 3, talking about strife. And I want you guys to see this scripture. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have, I want you to watch this, bitter envy and self-seekings in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. If you're operating out of envy, you're mad, you're out of love, you're self-seeking, you're born again, but you're giving way to the flesh and your mind. He says this wisdom does not descend from above. Now watch this. But it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Everybody say that with me. It's earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. For where envy strife and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Now he's not talking to the sinner. He's talking to the church. Well, you know what James is doing? He's preparing the body of Christ for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a new fresh way. And the first thing he does, he's telling us, guys, you've got to draw near to God. But as you're drawing near to God, get your heart clean. Walk away from the chaos. Walk away from the strife. And then he uses these three terms, which I think are amazing. Because I don't think it's just describing one particular form of wisdom. Because he'll go in and he'll tell you what the wisdom of purity is, and he names about eight. But I think this is a progression. Everything starts in the earthly. You know why? Because we're all earthly. You have your way of doing things. I have my way of doing things. And so when we get together, the potential of two earth people meeting equals conflict. I want macaroni grill. I'm not macaroni grill. I want Olive Garden. Really? I want Chewy's. My earth dust wants Chewy. Well, my earth dust wants Italian. I'm driving. <laughs> and how many know that's so easy? But conflict. How many got married and realized I married someone of the earth? They're just flat earthly, earthly. How am I going to survive? Oh, you will. It's just two dusty people get together. I'm just telling you. <laughs> and you have got to learn to bring it down a notch. Why? Because you're of the earth. God, wherever he goes, possible conflict. I mean, I'm traveling all over back in the... In the uh, 2000 all the way up to about 2018 and all. I travel all over around this country. So this guy invites me outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And I remember when I was getting ready to go catch the flight, he talked to me that morning. He said, now, whatever you do, don't eat lunch because I'm going to pick you up around 3. We're going to drive into Atlanta. It's about an hour. And then we're going to eat at Papa Do's. Have you ever eaten at Papa Do's? Oh, man. There will be one in heaven, and if not, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure there's one. You know, I'll plead mercy of God. So I am so looking forward to it. 
I get to that hotel, and it's around 2 o'clock. He told me he was picking me up at 3. Now, I have not eaten since I left Little Rock. I ate a bagel. So I've flown to Atlanta. They picked me up. They got me at the hotel. All kind of nice restaurants around. But we're not going to eat at those. We're going to Papa Dutch. So I am so thrilled on a Friday night. Well, 3, three o'clock comes. No pastor. 3.30 no phone call. 3.40, 4 o'clock. Now, I am really getting hungry. And I thought to myself, well, I'm just going to walk out. And I tried calling, couldn't get an answer. At 5 o'clock, phone rings, and he says, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Now, guys, I, I've been in Atlanta many a night. If you want a restaurant in Atlanta... You better be there at 4.30 or 5 on a Friday night. You're not going to get in. And so there I am, my earthly dust was getting stirred. I was, because honest, I would never do that to somebody. Never in a million years would I do that. You tell me, if I tell you I'll be there at 3 o'clock, that means I'm going to be there a quarter till 3. And my wife will verify that. That's a fact. You're late if you're five minutes early. That's just, that's me. That's my earthly man. And some of you go, oh, help me, Jesus. You know. but, but you're different. And we, we, have to, we have to accommodate. We have to deal. But my earthly dust was getting set up. I didn't, and I, I said, Father, I'm not saying one word. I keep my mouth shut. And I'm not having it. And we get in. How are you doing, Reverend Ed? So blessed to have you. I said, it's great. We are headed right to Papa Do's. Well, on the way to Papa Do's, he wanted to show me his old church that he pastored. And now my dust is flowing out the air conditioned vent. I mean, I'm, I am having to look and I'm going, I'm remembering what Kim always tells me. Pat Kim, you know, keep that dust in. And I, I just said, okay, forget it. I'm not going to say a word. So we finally get to Papa Do's Friday night at 7.30. We're an hour from the hotel. So he said, you can't imagine how busy it is. So he said, I'm going to go in and get, us a, get our names on the list. And he comes back and gets in the car. There's a three-hour wait. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you know, Friday night, Atlanta, 7.30. Uh, I've been here many times. It's just not going to happen. He said, we're going to drive down to this restaurant. I want everybody to know for two hours, we went to every restaurant in downtown Atlanta, and the way we could not get in but till around 10.30 or 11. Now, my dust has been going for a long time. Finally, I, I am so tired from travel. I hadn't eaten. I had a bagel, and that's it. Finally, he looked at me in desperation, and I said, Look, there were some really nice restaurants when I walked out. Why don't we drive back? It's going to be 1030 for sure. Let's drive back, and let's just eat there. And he said, Is that what you want to do? I, I didn't say, I didn't scream, but I... I said, yes. We drive back, and I want you to get this, 1030. Do you know every restaurant? Oh, it was still an hour and something away. Do you not? Do y'all know what I finally said? Right there were the golden arches. <laughs> and I looked at him at 1030 at night. I said, I am so hungry. I said, take me to McDonald's. No, no, no. And I said, I've got to get ready for the service. Thank you so much for considering this. But please, I want to say in the name of Jesus, let me have McDonald's. So we go up. A quarter, I mean, a, a Big Mac never, a Big Mac's it right? 
it never looked so good in a fry. I got a large fry, large Coke, and I think I ordered two hamburgers and sat down, and we ate, and he just said, well, you know, I really wanted to feed you something better. I didn't say anything. I said, well, one thing for sure. You probably will remember this for the rest of your life. This is the cheapest meal you've ever had to buy a traveling minister. And he laughed, and I said, I'll just walk to the hotel. And, hey, I did have an incredible meeting, but you know what? My dust could have got, listen to me, what happens with our dust, the earthly, is when we move it to the next level, it sinks in. And when you start giving to your flesh and your I've got to have it this way. I've got to have it that way. I mean, Kim and I learned, I mean, by going all over this world and culturally that we sat down and we became as the people. We never expected them to rise up to us. We knew that, that we loved and ate and became whatever it was and laughed with them, and they loved us for it. And so in that, I thank the Lord that I did not move it to the central. If I move it to the central, I want everybody to hear me, then I'm moving according to my feelings. Everything, it's not about you, it's about my feelings. You hurt my feelings. And so we're going to put the feelings out here, and so we've gone from earthly so now we're giving in to everything about us. This is my personality. I get to be mean because I, I'm a caloric. No, you don't. There's no caloric sanguine in the, in the Bible. No, no, no. There, there's none of that. That's all psychology. And yeah, it works, but that's not in the Bible. All the sanguines, all the calorics, all the phlegmatics, and the rest of us, we have to submit to the love of God. No matter what your attitude is. Because the Lord doesn't want you moving into the central because you're going to get unforgiveness. I tell you what, those people at the church, I'm about ready to rip their, because they did this and they did that. You're moving from earthly to central. And the more you lean on the central, then you open yourself up to the demonic. And that's why, I'm telling you, James is dealing with that church, telling them, I got a bunch of Jewish earth people, I got a Jewish dust bowl over here, and I got Gentile dust bowl who's just full of all kind of dust. And the two of you have got to come together and he said, so to the Jewish, you're going to have to lay all that sensual stuff down. It's over. You can't expect them to do it. That's why they hated Paul. They hated Peter. They hated James. Because James just stood up and said, I'm not going to have it. No, this church is about Jesus Christ. We are one. And we're going to come together no matter what we look like or what we eat. I think the Apostle Paul and some of them, once they had a good barbecue sandwich, I bet they said, you know what? G thank God for grace. <laughs> and they had a big lobster feast, and some of the Jews with their nose up, and Paul's like, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> this is incredible. Isn't it funny? And that kind of nonsense stuff starts to get into these last days. Everybody remember this. Strife, contention, the first thing we got to do is get forgiven. Let's forgive and let's move on. You can't carry the past with you. It'll destroy you. Nothing you can do about it. Do you know that grace is not here in the past? Grace is not jumping over to the future. Grace is right here at 1130 right here and we receive his grace and we choose to forgive and we're going to keep our earthly people our earthly stuff just loving one another and then being your dust for other people 
not worth the conflict. We take our faith in Jesus and move it over into the realm that the devil just laughs at us because our little dust is upset and he cannot get out. It's too late for all of that. So this week to us coming in, let's just step out. Anything in your life, just forgive, move, stay away from this stuff. Just move toward God. Draw nigh to me. And the scriptures say, I will draw nigh to you. As I draw nigh to him and I tell him, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for anger and what I've had. These people did me wrong. Forgive me. I forgive them and I bless them in the name of Jesus. I just want more of you. And we'll get into this, but he gives more grace to the humble. Amen. Father, everyone stand up with me. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Father, I just thank you so much for this congregation and who you are. Lord, I just bless you. Father, I thank you for just the power of the Holy Spirit knitting our hearts together in love. Oh, Father, that we respect each other more than we do ourselves. And we are here to please one another unconditionally the way you gave yourself for us. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I, we just all together, let's just bind any outside stuff, any strife, anything. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. We are unified for your glory and your presence. 